Now there is a melody, a pure orchestral song, known and loved to the outermost reaches of the civilized world. In fact, to many people, this series of notes is almost synonymous with the word melody. Its immediacy of appeal, its rising and falling line, its yearning and resignation, all these have identified it as the essence of late Romanticism. Almost everyone agrees that Tchaikovsky was a surpassing tunesmith, a shaper of melody second to none. But some musical highbrows delight in asking the barbed question, is Tchaikovsky really a symphonist? Since he is so great a melodist, why didn't he stick to writing songs or at best opera? What is this song we have just heard doing in a symphony anyway? Is it really a symphonic theme? One is obliged to answer no. It never gets developed in a proper symphonic way, or in any way for that matter. It appears as the second theme in the first movement and reappears dutifully in the recapitulation. That is all. Does that make it symphonic material? No. Then is this pathétique really a symphony? Yes. Let us see why. Actually, if we browse through the work, we find that this is the only melody that is not really thematic in a symphonic sense. All the others partake much more of the nature of symphonic themes. That is, they are based on short motives or figures which can be altered in endless ways to effect a symphonic metamorphosis. They are not simply tunes that you go out whistling. Look at the slow introduction, for instance. This is rather a motive than a melody. A motive that repeats in an ascending way. Out of it is born the main theme of the Allegro section, certainly not something to whistle. Skipping for the moment over the second theme, the beautiful melody we have already discussed, we come upon a development section devoted almost entirely to the motives of the first theme. And there are no further themes as such. So you see that most of this first movement is not at all concerned with pure song. Moreover, we could go through the other three movements in the same way, with more or less the same findings. And it turns out that the symphony is really more symphonic in character than its critics pretend. Well then, what are those hypercritical critics fussing about? Why are they so hard on Tchaikovsky? They would answer, it is a matter of unity, of form. That kind of inevitable formal flow that makes the symphonies of Beethoven so great. In Beethoven, they point out, B flows out of A and C out of B and D out of C in a way that makes you feel nothing else could possibly have come at any one point. Whereas with Tchaikovsky, they say, anything can happen anywhere. In a sense, they are right. Tchaikovsky's formal procedures are somewhat academic, following the general broad outlines laid down by the German masters, but using those outlines for his own purposes, melodic or dramatic, rather than creating an original sonata form out of the material itself. This is important in the realm of the higher criticism, but it does not make his symphonies any the less symphonies. They are only of another category, born of other impulses, more immediately dramatic, more concerned with shattering contrasts, striking opposites, variety rather than unity. And given their place in history at the peak of 19th century romanticism, they have their own validity. But this argument alone would not sustain the validity of Tchaikovsky's symphonies. No matter how one argues, there must always be unity, some element of real form, the sense of going forward that makes any good symphony a kind of single journey through time. 
And this Tchaikovsky has, but in his own way. What really binds these four movements of the pathétique together into one unit is the inner relation of all the material, the brotherhood of themes. There are several distinct elements that unite the material in this work, and the chief one is the constant use of simple scales, up or down, but mostly down, which is natural, I suppose, in a so-called pathetic piece. I was amazed when I first studied this work to find how much of the symphony is derived from scales. Out of them grow themes, motives, figurations, counterpoint, bass lines, and even tunes. Going back to the very beginning, we find that the slow introduction immediately presents a scale-wise motive. And this motive ascends scale-wise, as we noted before. When this motive turns into the main theme, its progress is continued by pure eight-note descending scales. The first climax is achieved by an ascending scale followed by a descending one. Now there comes an episode in which the descending scale is again the controlling factor, alternating between the bass and the treble. A stronger climax is now reached using the scale-wise motive as well as full rushing downward scales. When all this scaly fury has finally subsided, we are ready for the introduction of our famous popular song theme. And even this begins with three notes of a descending scale. The continuation of the melody is also based on scale motion. Now comes a bridge passage with more pulse and this time ascending scales are the chief material. As it continues, Tchaikovsky even introduces a counterpoint in the brass of a slower ascending scale, so that we are now hearing scales within scales. The exposition of themes is now complete, and it seems that we have heard nothing but scales. Actually, it is much more interesting than that and much of the interest derives from the great variety of ways in now which Tchaikovsky Handel erupts with that famous crash. And Tchaikovsky begins to develop his first theme. You remember it? By making a fugue-like passage out of it, but in doing so, he employs as his counter-subject, you guessed it, a scale. This whole fugato, in fact, is built on climbing scale motion. But at the climax, the descending scale takes over. One could go on this way, finding endless uses of the scale throughout the movement, but I think the point is already clear enough. Let us only note the ostinato scale played by the plucked strings at the close of the movement as a kind of tranquil final statement under a brass chorale.
and so on. Now one would think that Tchaikovsky had really exploited the device of scales to his satisfaction and that of the hearers. But no, he has only begun. In the remaining three movements, he uses scales constantly, not only as figuration, but for themes themselves. In fact, the second movement begins immediately with a charming melody in 5-4 time, built out of ascending and descending major scales. Later, he accompanies the already scaly theme with faster scales pizzicato. For the middle section of this song form movement, he builds a contrasting languishing melody again out of a simple descending scale over a repeated timpani beat. The coda of this movement is almost an exercise in scales, descending ones of a sustained nature in the winds against climbing ones more flowing in the strings. third movement, the great march that always draws applause from the audience even though the symphony is not yet finished, we find scales rushing, careening, whistling and flying throughout the movement. Here are a few instances. In the very first theme, the fourth bar is made of two swooping scales. Here is the theme in the orchestra. Later, he uses that scale this way. Now notice the descending scale that accompanies the new theme. Then the veritable hurricane of scales at the climax. And the grand finale of scales at the end of the movement. If this is beginning to sound to you like a symphony of scales, you must remember that I am picking out only the passages relevant to the point I am making, and rather than condemn Tchaikovsky for his primitive materials, we should admire and praise him for the ingenuity Perhaps with which he handles it. An example of this way. is to be found in the wonderful last movement, the lamenting adagio, which gives the symphony its nom de guerre of pathétique. It was bold and brave of Tchaikovsky to end a symphony with a tragic slow movement, and perhaps it was willful and arbitrary too, but it works, and it works in an amazingly effective way. And one of the reasons that this finale does not seem like a separate entity, despite its unprecedented tempo and position, is that it is bound to its fellow movements by the same use of scale-wise motion. It is awesome to consider what Tchaikovsky could make from the scales practiced every day by pianists and singers and violinists. A dramatic first movement, a gracious and wistful second, a brilliant march, and now this heartbreaking dirge. This dirge is constructed around two themes, both of them born of the descending scale, which, as we said earlier, is the natural direction for scales to take in a pathetic symphony. The first theme is this.
The second theme goes this way. are made of the downward scale, yet how different they are. The first, anguished and desperate, the second, noble and resigned. Between them and around them, other scale passages abound, gloomy ones, singing ones, plaintive ones. We might quote only the climactic section before the reprise or recapitulation, in which the scales gain speed until they become a whirlwind, much as they did in the preceding march movement. And almost the last sounds you hear in the symphony are the dying echoes of the descending scale. to give you the impression that scales are the only unifying force in this work. There are others, chief among them the fresh and original use of the interval of the fourth. This is an interval that is very common in Western music, almost basic we might say, since the two tones involved have a strong diatonic relationship. Think of bugle calls like taps, for example. Or the theme from La Glaisienne of Bizet. But Tchaikovsky uses the fourth in a new way. He builds fourth upon fourth. Or in the descending version, creating a sound which is prophetic of Hindemith and much other 20th century music. Now listen to this bit of the development section in the first movement and notice the descending intervals of the fourth in the brass. Did you hear the fourths? This has always impressed me as brilliantly original on Tchaikovsky's part. But he is not content to use it only in one place, he has used these fourth constructions as a unifying factor throughout the work. In the reprise of this movement, the following passionate section occurs, building to its climax by ascending fourths. Did you recognize the intervals? On these intervals of the fourth, he builds his motive. But the real festival of fourths occurs in the third movement, the march. The principal theme is made out of these two intervals of the fourth. combined in a way that produces the familiar tune you all know. It is only hinted at toward the beginning, with the plucked strings showering sparks of descending fourths upon it.
but later it appears as a full marching tune. But first, Tchaikovsky has more to say about the fourth. There is a piquant tune in the plucked strings and piccolo, combining fourths with our old friend the scale. You see how he piles up three intervals of the fourth like blocks to make this odd sound. And then when it comes to developing his march tune, we are barraged with fourths exploding all over the orchestra. as if he is erecting great pyramids of fourths. One of the more subtle uses of the fourth occurs in the last movement, in which both themes are written so that they lie within that interval. The first theme, for instance, has for its extremities these two notes, which spell out a fourth. And the same is true for the second theme, which lies between these two poles, again a fourth apart. We could go on multiplying these examples, but this record has a time limit. One should mention, however, a few other unifying forces in this strange and powerful work, the constant use of the dark colors of violas, celli, bassoons, and low horns in a special mournful way which gives the work an extra pathos. Again, one could speak of the persistent use of dissonance, which spreads pain throughout the music. There are many others, too technical to go into here. But even what we have studied so far should arm us against those attackers of Tchaikovsky who refuse to admit him as a symphonist. After all, the sense of form is a delicate and elusive thing and operates in many different ways. Tchaikovsky's way to unity may not be Beethoven's, but it is nonetheless valid, communicative, and deeply moving. <laughs> 